I'm okay for right now. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you hear me? We're good? Yes. All right. Good morning. Um, Pastor Matt gave me a little bit of advice um, yesterday. He said, once you have the microphone, you are in control. It doesn't matter what you say. Just don't make eye contact with your dad and you'll be all right. So he's full of uh, tidbits of wisdom. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Pastor Matt. <laughs> <laughs> with, with that in mind, uh, let me pray before we get in the Word this morning. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Um, we thank you for loving us and choosing us to be your people, God, um, for instilling us with the Holy Spirit um, and um, giving us your Word, God, as truth. Um, I pray that we would build our lives on that truth, God, um, of your Word, um, that we would um, dive into your Word this morning and you would use it as a lamp to our feet, God, um, and guide us. Um, for the rest of this week, and, and as we continue to go out past this service. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, my family and I are big uh, Tolkien and Lord of the Rings fans. We love the books. We love the movies. Um, my wife even loves it more than Star Wars, which the jury's still out on that decision. Um, but as most of you know, it is the story of a hobbit, um, a very small person with very large, hairy feet, um, given a task to make a journey to Mordor in order to destroy a ring that will save the world from the oppression of the dark forces of Sauron. And what draws my attention to this story is how Tolkien places the power to save the world not in a superhero's hands, but rather in the hands of an unimportant tiny hobbit. In the series, Gandalf the Wizard puts it perfectly. He says, some believe that it is only great power that can hold evil in check. But that's not what I found. I found that it is the small things everyday deeds by ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. And this story draws striking similarities to the Bible and how God desires to use his people in order to advance his kingdom. So if you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be in Judges 6 this morning, um, talking about Gideon. Um, and before I start reading, um, my dad and I have been getting up three, four times a week and, and doing apologetics and just talking about the Bible, how to read the Bible, understanding the Bible, um, and the most important point that he's kind of driving home right now is understanding when I'm reading the Bible is that it is the unfolding of God's plan to redeem his creation, um, especially in the Old Testament when a lot of strange things happen to God's people, the Israelites, and you, you have questions about what's going on with the Israelites, why certain things happen to them. Um, it's important to, to remember that this story is the unfolding plan of God's um, redemption for his creation, and his plan isn't over yet. Um, he chose this people, the Israelites, a direct line of Jesus, and these people continually got it wrong and continually needed God's help um, in order to help them get out of certain situations. Um, it's a common theme that we find throughout the Old Testament and throughout um, our times today, and um, in, especially in the book of Judges, where we'll be this morning. It says it in four times in the book of Judges that the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, and so we just want to talk about how the Lord uses his people um, and desires to use his people to advance his kingdom. So we'll start in Judges 6, verses 1 through 10 this morning. And the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, the caves, and the strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt out of the land of slavery, I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites, and in whose land you lived, but you have not listened to me. So we see this theme here, um, the Israelites um, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Um, they had just been rescued from Egypt, and settling in the Amorites' land that God had given them. He gave them a simple instruction not to worship their gods, and they directly disobeyed. 
And now we have Midian who is oppressing them, hundreds of thousands of people living in their land, oppressing their cattle, their crops, making it very hard for Israel to live. And so they turn to God and cry out for help. And here we find the Lord in his mercy decides to use someone from his people in order to help deliver them. We continue in verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and he sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? <clears throat> but now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So here we have an angel appearing to Gideon, who is in a wine press threshing wheat. Now, forgive me, I'm not a professional wheat thresher, but I'm pretty sure one doesn't thresh wheat in a wine press. So we have Gideon here who's hiding um, from the Midianites, threshing wheat in the wine press. And the angel appears to him and he says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, in his own eyes, Gideon says, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest, and I am the least of my family. He feels like he's the furthest thing from a mighty warrior, which the Lord calls him. Gideon, in fact, wasn't only suspect about his own abilities, but he was very bitter and angry about the oppression of the Israelites. He said, Lord, if you're with us, then why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But he has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now, even though the Israelites had been given clear instructions when they moved into the Amorite land, and chose, they chose to be disobedient. So Gideon and the rest of his people are wildly wrong for being angry at God. But God, in his mercy and his love, he meets Gideon in his pain and in his anguish. The Lord remains the same today. If he chose not to meet anyone in the midst of their anger and their confusion then he would never be in relationship with anyone but Jesus because he's the only one that's perfect. Now, in spite of our sinful nature, God looks at each one of us and he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, because he desires to use us and he desires to work with us. The Lord clearly looks upon Gideon and he smiles because if this is the man that he's chosen to save his people, then he will receive the glory. This is the same God who used a man named Moses with a speech impediment to take his people out of Egypt. The same God who used an old man named Noah to build a boat to save his people from the flood. The same God who used Joshua to march around the walls of Jericho and sound trumpets to break down those walls and fall down. The Bible makes it very clear here that it does not matter who Gideon is. It doesn't matter who I am and it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who God is and who God says he is. The same God who created the universe and everything in it, he calls you to advance his kingdom. He desires to use his people as long as we're the ones who say, okay, Lord, use me. We pick back up in verse 19. Um, we find Gideon again and says, Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat from an ephah of flour. He made the bread without yeast and putting the meat in a basket and in its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. <clears throat> then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock and consuming the meat and the bread. The angel of the Lord disappeared. And when Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abezrites. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of its height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as an offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him, but because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. So here we see first, and as a number of times in this chapter, chapter, the Lord appears to Gideon. He shows him that he is with him by 
him placing this meat and this unleavened bread on the altar immediately gets consumed by the fire the angel touches it with, and Gideon falls prostrate. He feels like he's not worthy. He's not worthy to lead the Lord's people, and God says, you're not going to die. I have chosen you to lead my people. Now, here's what I need you to do first. He calls Gideon to go down and start with his own home and his own personal life. The fact that God chooses work with us does not make our sin okay. He calls to advance his kingdom, calls us to advance his kingdom even though we are sinners, and he often calls us to address that sin and brokenness. So he had Gideon go into his father's backyard, tear down the idols that they had been worshiping for the Amorite gods with the Asherah pole and the, and the altar of Baal. And he says, if you're going to lead my people, you have to start with your own life. You have to start with your family and your personal life. And then you can go and you can um, be with my people. Last week, my dad talked about the things that don't fit in the lives of a Christian. And in order to be who God has called us to be, sometimes we have to get rid of the idols in our own backyards before we can advance his kingdom. To summarize the rest of the story, we have Gideon who's going and he's going to prepare an army for this battle, but he's still struggling to believe that the Lord is with him and that he desires to use him. So in his weakness, he lays out these fleeces for the Lord. And he says, Lord, if you are truly with me, please let the fleece be wet and the ground be dry when I wake up in the morning um, from the dew. And the Lord meets him in his weakness and he says, okay, I will have mercy on you. Gideon wakes up, the fleece is wet and the ground is dry. Gideon goes, okay, one more time, Lord, one more time, this is it. If this, if this is truly you, God, then, then I will go and um, lead your army um, into the Midianites. And he says, this time, if the ground would be wet and the fleece would be dry, then I, then I will truly believe that you're with me, God. And the Lord says, okay, get in. All right, I'll meet you here. I'll be merciful again once again. I think it's important here to note that as New Testament followers who have been filled with the Holy Spirit, that it is unbiblical to require something of the Lord. Before the Holy Spirit was gifted to the people of God, there were very few times, Gideon being one of them, where the Lord mercifully allowed his people to address him in this fashion. But us being filled with the Holy Spirit now, it's unbiblical for us to require this of the Lord. But the Lord mercifully met Gideon in this place of his weakness and said, I am with you. I am here for you. So he proceeds to gather a small army of 22,000, very small compared to the hundreds of thousands that the Midianites have. And the Lord says, Gideon, that's way too many men. Yet you need to ask the ones that are afraid to go home. So he takes the 22,000, and it goes down to 10,000. The Lord says, Gideon, that's too many men. If you guys were to go into battle right now, I would not receive the glory because you believe and your people would believe that you delivered yourselves instead of me. Go down to the water, and those that drink from their hands like a dog will be the ones that go with you into the army. From 10,000, he goes from 10,000 to 300. And the Lord says, these are the men that you will take into battle. At that point, if I were Gideon, I would, I would be skeptical myself, taking 300 men against hundreds of thousands. Um, and he reveals to Gideon one last time of his, of his faithfulness to Gideon. Um, he, he has Gideon and a servant go down to the Midianite Valley, and here's a dream about how one of the Midians, well, one of the Midianites has a dream about how the Israelites are coming into the camp and are going to attack them. Gideon, full of energy from hearing this, gathers his 300 men, spreads them around the valley with the trumpets, and all at once they blow their trumpets, and they cause such a commotion that it strikes fear into the Midianites that they began to turn on each other, kill themselves, and then flee the Israelites' land. Now here we see that this has nothing to do with Gideon and everything to do with God. God does things here that Gideon could never have done on his own. But in his grace and in his mercy, he chooses Gideon to lead his people to a mighty victory. The Bible makes it clear that the people of God consistently mess it up and get it wrong. The Bible also makes it clear that he consistently uses his people for the advancement of his kingdom and the glory here on the earth. His desire is to use the people of God to do what we were called and created to do. There's no excuse for us to be bitter and angry against God who made you for the things that, you, that happen in your life. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And his desire is for you to bring the hope of the gospel here on the earth. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for choosing us as your people, God. Um, 
for allowing you to, to use us for the advancement of your kingdom. Um, I pray that we would go this week and we would say, Lord, here I am, use me um, for the advancement of your kingdom and, to be, and for the hope of the gospel here on the earth, God. We love you, Father. Um, we thank you for your goodness and your love that you lavish on us continually. We praise your name, God, in Jesus' name.